seated, please. Well, again, just as a reminder, in case you're in that groove, we are not in Luke. We are in 1 Timothy, starting to dive in to the text this morning. We made some headway last week through the introduction, and now we will pursue into the first chapter, looking at the first two verses. I can assure you it will not be a 10-minute message for two verses, but I can assure you that I will be as faithful as the Spirit has led me to be faithful with this text in what he has for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come to you through Christ, grateful for all he has done, thankful, Holy Spirit, for how you use the Apostle Paul to pen these words, to share them with his beloved son, Timothy, and how you have preserved them through the ages and have practical meaning for us today as a body of believers for a church, this local church, and what that means for us to live out what has been left for us to teach, convict, challenge, and encourage us. Glorify yourself through the preaching of your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I often do, I have a question to pose to you. Who was that one influential person in your Christian life, or two influential people in your Christian life, as you think back, When you first became a Christian, who spent time discipling you? Now, for some of you, that may have been the time immediately after coming to faith in Christ. For others, it may have been and is still ongoing. Whether it's by the same person, perhaps, or other people. There are those that God has used in our life when we became a Christian to teach us, to grow us, to point out things in Scripture of how our lives ought to change to reflect Christ, to honor and worship and glorify God first and foremost. For me, as I answer that question, it was a few people. It was first my grandmother, who was so diligent and faithful in living out her Christian faith before me as a rambunctious little individual who spent a lot of time with her. From there, being in a church that she found for us, moving in junior high, and then a junior high youth pastor that God placed in my life to confront me on some very serious things. But he did that out of love. It went from that junior high youth pastor to the senior high youth pastor who just dove in and invested his life not only in me but in everyone in the youth group. There are times when we see value in those positions. But I would also be remiss to not mention how God used my wife in my life, even before we were married. Her challenges and and calling me to live a holy life. And so God uses people in our lives through this ongoing work of sanctification and growing in what we know as discipleship and what that means. It reminds us that we don't just simply grow in our love for Christ and living out our Christian faith by ourselves. I mean, we see this all throughout scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. And yet, when you think about it in these terms, you think about it for parents. Parents, don't we desire to see our our children come to saving faith and nurture them along to be obedient to the scriptures ourselves? We, We pray for this for those who are parents when they become parents. We labor to that end. I mean, this is the same not only in, in, in this sphere of ministry, but in the spiritual realm as well. When it comes to our lives and those who are true children of the faith, We see the impact and how that comes particularly through the means of the local church and what God has endorsed and ordained for that means to come about. Yes, we have men and women in our lives speaking truth to us. But as we we see as new covenant people, 
we come in the context of the local church. And, and this is exactly where we find Paul and Timothy even at this juncture in their lives together. I mean, Paul reiterates not only what he has done working with Timothy and having Timothy alongside of him, but if you remember, and we'll get to it eventually, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will then be able to teach others also. So you see this ongoing role of discipleship going on and what that looks like. I mean, when you think about Paul's life, and all the people that are mentioned that have been placed in his life in the providence of God, Dionysus, Damaris, Gaius, Salpiter, Tychicus, Trophimus, Stephanus, Clement, Epaphras, the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, and many others. You think of that list even at the end of Romans in Romans 16. Or the people that he has encouraged and have been encouraged by. All of these, most likely, fruits of his labor and from his labor. And yet, here we are in 1 Timothy, and we see this is the same for these two men. Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and under the authority of the Holy Spirit, and we hear, as I read and as you hear, the same authority behind what Paul writes for us today. He writes, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Where is he going to go with these two verses, you may be wondering. Well, here we go. You, you think about Paul at the time of this writing. He's coming to the end of his life. You think of the world-changing events going on. Here is this great missionary sent out to minister to the Gentiles there in Acts 9. He is an apostle. He is an ambassador for God, called to this specific role as an eyewitness of the risen Christ. He was appointed to teach people with divine authority, and here he is reminding Timothy all that God has used him to minister to Timothy so that he may minister to others, particularly there in Ephesus. As we go through this epistle, I want us to keep one thing in mind. So turn to chapter 3 of 1 Timothy at the very end in verses 14 and 15. Because although you may not have picked it up when, as I read through the whole book last week, I think what we hear here in these verses really plays throughout from verse 1 of chapter 1 all the way through the end of the book, where Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Th this is what may be called the melodic line of 1 Timothy. I, I believe this is it. And so I, I mention that, so this is kind of etched in your mind as we go through the various passages and how they all really do reflect back to this one verse so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. So whether that's dealing with the issues in the congregation, whether it's dealing with false teachers and their teaching, how does that affect body life together? That's where he's going. So remember that particular verse there in verse 15 of chapter 3. All that to say, as we come together this morning, our, our aim together is to be reminded that the Christian life is simply not about the individual. Not about individual members of a local church, but it is about life together and what the church is as we come together. When we are surrounded by a culture that is truly against us and for what we stand for, just as Paul and Timothy dealt with that in the first century, so we address that and deal with that today as we will until we die or Jesus returns. So what does that look like? We live in a culture that truly has no rest, no true hope, no true peace apart from Christ. And the restlessness, we, we know about that. We've heard it through the news this week. All of this to say how we are then reminded of the importance and the value of investing in one another's lives, 
not simply when we come together on a Sunday morning, but really throughout the week and the months. Of investing in our lives together, whether it's discipling a new believer to an ongoing encouragement of a brother and sister in Christ, it means that it takes time and effort and sweat and tears and love and patience and sometimes hurt. This is where I see the apostle kind of starting and coming from the starting point here in these first two verses. Because what we're hearing Paul say is, here am I and the gifts and how God has called me and used me and how I was able to then invest my life through the ministry of working together in various ministry opportunities. And now here you are in Ephesus to do the same. Take what you have learned through the time we've been together and now serve others. So you see Paul in verse 1 laying this foundation for discipleship. And discipleship, you know, even today is still a, a bit of a buzzword in our evangelical circles. And that takes on all different forms and meanings. But Paul here really does lay down the foundation for discipleship there in verse 1. And because of this foundation, then you see the fruit of this discipleship coming out in the life of Timothy. Which we will get at as we work through this epistle. So he lays this foundation. He writes Paul. Again, we see and affirm the authorship of this epistle. He is saying here is the authority in writing to you as this would have then been read to the church there. Here's the authority behind this writing. They knew him. And so we not only know the author, we know the authority behind it, but then he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so we have to think through, why is he establishing this? Why is he saying this? Was Paul on some power trip to say, I've established myself as an apostle and therefore I'm writing this to have this authority to push you and force you to, to do this and be this way as you serve one another? Timothy, as you serve in the local church there in Ephesus? No. He wasn't self-appointed. He wasn't even commissioned by the church as an apostle. He was commissioned by God himself in this role. He was chosen, called, and commissioned by God back in Acts 9. His apostleship, he says here, came by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. Here is his claim for his authority in writing to Timothy to encourage and admonish Timothy. So much so he is even encouraging and admonishing the church as they would hear this read in what he's about to say. He's laying that groundwork in this greeting. <coughs> Excuse me. He has been commanded by the Father and the Son. So even in this authority behind his apostleship, he is also expressing the authority of God the Father and God the Son in the deity of Christ in this. <coughs> so already we are seeing where he might be going, and what he might have to address in the book. I mean, he, he's not even in this greeting following anything that he hasn't already written about. He's just following this regular practice and how he would greet the churches other than maybe Galatians, or except since Galatians, other than in Philippians and Colossians, where he asserts his apostolic authority there. And so there is a concern and what Timothy is dealing with there in Ephesus to say, perhaps, Timothy, you don't have authority. And who's giving you this authority? Again, when we think about the context of why Paul is writing, who he's writing to, the situation there in Ephesus, he's going to address in the next set of verses this whole issue against false teachers. So there was this questioning of Timothy's authority and even Paul's authority as he writes to Timothy. So he starts off with this reminder that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we see in various other places where he brings up this authority. He was Christ's chosen ambassador. He has witnessed the resurrected Christ. 
just like the other 11 and then 12 after Judas kills himself, and now Paul as the 13th apostle. He says, I was given this by command of God our Savior. He's looking back to the salvation that is accomplished by God through the Son. Timothy, remember who you are in Christ and what God has done. You go back in 1 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 1, Ephesians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1, you see this phrase as well concerning his commissioning. That not only Paul and not only Timothy, but even the congregation there at Ephesus are divinely commissioned. <clears throat> they were under orders of the sovereign God of the universe in dealing with the problems that were there and how they relate to one another. Again, I think it's most likely that he brings us out right in the front because of the issues dealing with the false teachers and the teachings that were starting to infiltrate the church. And so he needs to bring this authoritative word to them, not heavy-handed, but to say there is strength behind what I am writing to you, Timothy, and what I am writing to you, fellow brothers and sisters, as this would have been read. He says there he's an apostle of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. And so Paul, in light of everything that's going on, is not only looking at the present, he's looking at the future. For the Christian, we have hope now for those who are in Christ in this present time, in the present realities, in the present struggles we are facing, in the present regimes and governments ruling over us, and over them. To stand firm, to stand firm when false teachers try to creep in. How do you address them? Instead of saying, oh, everything's all kumbaya, can't we all just get along? Church, you will have to deal with false teachers and their teaching. Be prepared. Know that you not only have the authority vested in him as the apostle, but it comes from God himself and by Christ. Stand firm. He'll deal with this whole aspect of this future hope later on in chapter 6. I love what John Stott says here. He explains it this way. Paul locates his apostleship in a historical context whose beginning was the saving activity of God our Savior in the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus and whose culmination will be Christ Jesus, our hope. His personal and glorious coming, which is the object of our Christian hope and which will bring down the curtain on the historical process, end quote. I, I hope, I trust you're encouraged by that quote. To wonder what is going to happen. Is this the beginning of World War III in these, in these world events, historical events? I don't know. It may very well be. But my hope is not in a human government that God has placed us under. My hope is in Christ and his return and all that he has accomplished through his life, death, resurrection, <clears throat> and ascension, sitting at the right hand of the Father. It doesn't mean that we don't, we're not concerned, we're, we, we're not aware of these things. But as Paul is writing to Timothy, he had to deal with these things. <clears throat> By way of application, I would simply say it this way, though we or no one else bears the title apostle after the 12 apostles and Paul himself. We must remember that by the grace of God, through the ministry of the word and the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring a message to others that carries weight and authority in speaking truth into their life, both to unbelievers and believers. We were talking about this a little bit in the membership class kind of our role and responsibility as members, as brothers and sisters in Christ, first at the local church level and then to other brothers and sisters in the church universal and what that looks like and what that means. So Paul here, in writing to Timothy, before he gets on into the, and dives deeper into what's happening there in Ephesus and in Timothy's life specifically, <clears throat> 
He says, let me lay this foundation where this authority is coming from. It's coming from what God is doing through me as a called apostle. And so when you are questioned on the authority that in which you speak, go back to my authority as it's given by the Holy Spirit. We come with the authority of the scriptures before us. And so Paul lays out the foundation for Timothy. And then he addresses and he knows the fruit that has come from this authority, this foundation that he has laid with Timothy. We see this in verse 2. He's mentioning him, calling him out specifically by name there in verse 2, to Timothy, my true child in the face. In the faith, not in the face. And to, and to see here the significance of, and the depth of intimacy between the apostle and Timothy, his co-laborer. It is the faith in Christ and through Christ that has brought them together to begin with. And then to serve together. And now for Timothy to be in this place and shepherding the people there in Ephesus. All that has come about from life and ministry together. I mean, of all the people that Paul ministered to, there are only two that, that bear kind of this title that he uses here, my true child in the faith. One is Titus, who eventually we will get to the book of Titus, little epistle of Titus, and Timothy. We don't know a whole lot about Titus. But we do know what Paul wrote to Timothy and about him. You remember if you look at Philippians 2, verses 19 through 22. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. To the Corinthian believers in chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, verse 17. That's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Timothy was Paul's co-laborer. He was a friend. He was his dear son, Timothy. And so by the time Paul writes 1 Timothy at the end of his life, we, we think perhaps Timothy had been around Paul for about 15 years. Considering all that time together, everything that happened together, he left him behind in Berea with Silas after persecution caused Paul to leave for Athens there in Acts 17. Timothy would later join Paul. He was at, with Paul in Corinth. He was sent by Paul into Macedonia, Acts 19. Accompanied him on his return trip to Jerusalem, Acts 20. He was with Paul when he wrote Romans there. If you read in Romans 16, when he wrote 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, the Thessalonian epistles, and even Philemon. Oftentimes, Paul would send Timothy to be his kind of troubleshooter, to work through things. And so he sent him to Corinth, to Thessalonica, to Philippi, and even here at Ephesus. Paul knew Timothy. And all the time that they had spent together, surely Timothy would understand Paul's church dynamics. But that doesn't happen on a whim. Just like life together. When someone first comes, you may get to know them, introduce yourself, they introduce themselves to you. But as we fellowship more and more, we get to know one another. We get to know struggles. We get to know even sins that one struggles with. We get to know the joys, the hurts, how to serve together, how to easily overlook offenses. This is Timothy and Paul's relationship. They were so, uh, I'm trying to figure out just the right word. I don't want to use in tune with each other. But because they had served together in all this time, Paul knew he could trust Timothy to serve the church there at Ephesus and serve them well, to see them grow, to become a healthier church. And even in that, they still struggled with issues around them. 
Paul sees the fruit of his ministry in the life of Timothy because Paul invested time and resources as he calls Timothy to come with him on those journeys. He says, Timothy, you are like my true child in the faith. That's how close they were. But we'll see and ask the question how this plays out for you and I today in a little bit. But he goes on to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Outside the pastoral epistles, Paul's regular salutation is just simply grace and peace. Here he interjects mercy. Perhaps when you think about these terms, grace was more along the sides in the greeting along the Greek culture. Peace was more along the sides within the Jewish context of shalom. And perhaps given the makeup of the church to bring this in there. There was perhaps in Jewish writings this whole idea of mercy and peace tied together that we see. Which even if you look at Galatians 6 verse 16, Paul ties these two ideas together of grace and mercy. When we think about this word grace, it's not simply God's free gift of salvation. There's so much more to that. But it is a reminder that salvation has indeed come to God's elect. We, we cannot simply just wash over and gloss over this word grace. Because what it does, it reminds us of our inability to save ourselves. Or for anyone to save themselves. It's a reminder that apart from God's grace through Christ, we are lost and dead in our sin. And so... Paul, in writing these words to Timothy in this greeting, <coughs> grace to you, brother. Remember where you are because of what Christ has done. How you serve. That you, my friend, are the recipient. You required the help of another. And that was God. <coughs> Excuse me. He then goes from grace to mercy. When we think about this word mercy, doesn't that just kind of take our, our big bubble of our ego and just bring a pin to it and deflate it so quickly? You think about God's grace in light of what he has done for us through Christ and his life, death, resurrection, and his ascension. To then bring in mercy, again, that we are in need of, of someone else. That we cannot do this on our own. It brings out the important understanding of this concept in order to have a healthy sense of one's own sin and our need. God has shown us mercy, brothers and sisters. My need was so great apart from Christ, I could never earn any bit of righteousness through what I have done in my own strength and merits, and neither can you. When we think about our own sin and our own need prior to coming to faith and putting our faith and trust in the finished work of Christ, it is all of God's mercy. And then peace. He says it here, he'll say it, Later on in 2 Timothy, in the very greeting there in, in verse 2 of chapter 1, perhaps he is taking this Jewish sense of peace, shalom, and bringing this background in even for the church there and for Timothy. To have Jewish background, having a, a Greek father and Jewish mother, and bringing this reminder in. And this word peace reminds us that we have been reconciled to God through Christ and his atoning work. This is why, my friends, the gospel matters to us. This is why it matters when we come together. This is why it matters when we go out these doors and go to our homes and go in our neighborhoods and go to work tomorrow or today, if you have to work today, or go to school 
what that means among friends and what that even means among enemies. That true peace only comes when it is rooted in the finished work of Christ. Hallelujah. To think of these terms, grace, mercy, and peace, draws us back to what we just finished going through in Luke. Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And so as Paul thinks about the fruits of his labors as he partnered with Timothy going about, he's bringing to mind in Timothy, to Timothy and for Timothy, that as they've had this partnership together, it's not rooted in their friendship. It's not rooted in all they've accomplished in church life and solving problems. But it is rooted in the Father and the Son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So why can a church have peace among its midst? Because we understand that apart from the gospel, we wouldn't have peace. We can have peace even when it comes to the context of a local church. That does not mean that everything is going to be all peachy keen. And everything is going to go right. And we're not going to wrestle and struggle with disagreements with our brothers and sisters. We want to work to resolve them rightly and godly. So in these two verses, we see really this role of discipleship and what it looks like. The foundation behind it was Paul investing time, calling Timothy to come with him and go with him. Understanding Timothy's giftedness, how he could best be used in the providence of God in matters concerning the furtherance of his kingdom. And so we have to think about that regarding discipleship in our context as a local church, as brothers and sisters, and what that means. And when we think about this whole aspect of discipleship to see that it is always and forever must be rooted in Christ. That's why Paul draws it to the very conclusion there at the end of verse 2. So that personalities and skill sets and giftedness do not get in the way. How they can be used. So the local church can reflect Christ. Christ. And be true light in the darkness. So Paul understands his foundational role. He understands and sees the fruit of his ministry. And now he writes to encourage Timothy in the foundations he will lay. And discipling other men and women in the local church. And how that plays out then as Titus expounds, as I've said, older men teaching younger men, the older women teaching younger women. And this intergenerational ministry. And what that means. But what does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? What does that mean for us as a local church? What does that mean for every true believer? We were reading through chapter 1 last evening for our, our Bible reading as a family. <clears throat> and this thought came again, credit my wife, for this thought. And I want to share that with you this morning because I think it encapsulates these two verses here and really sets the stage as we go through 1 Timothy. And that's this question Who is my Timothy? Who in, in my life has God placed that I can spend time with to disciple, invest in them? Now, we've got to think, and that has all kinds of nuances. For parents, you invest in your children. For those in the workforce, you may invest in another believer's life at work, at school, discipling, even in the school context. But who is my Timothy? And to say, do I even have someone in my life that I am discipled or being discipled by? 
and how that plays out <clears throat> in, the <clears throat> in the furtherance of body life together as the church grows. Or if and when the church leads you or your family someplace else because of job transfer or job loss, what that looks like. So we ask the question, who am I discipling? Who am I encouraging regularly? Who am I doing life ministry with for the betterment of Christ's bride, the local church? Who is that? Who, who, maybe another question is, who might that be? So we have these ministries involved, men's Bible study, women's Bible study, Sunday school, corporate worship, being involved in other Bible studies. But to think through that, what that might look like, how, how life might be just a little bit different. It, it, it's, a, it's a question that is not only thoughtful, but might be a bit scary. How can I adjust my time and my situation any more than what it, I already am? And that's not to say you're going to invest hours upon hours in a given week. Maybe it's a 10-minute phone call conversation every other day or once a week. But to think through it in those terms. And the different components of, again, when we think of body life, you think of Paul and Timothy traveling together the time they spent, and now Timothy here <clears throat> for this local church and all the situations that were going on and the people there and all the situations going on in our lives together. And what that means to be reminded that those who are single in our church need those who are married around them and, and giving into their lives. And, and on the flip side, those who are married need single men and women investing in our lives as well, reminding us. Maybe pointing out things that we're just blind to. Because you see the interconnectedness of body life together. So it's not just, you know, the 30-somethings or the 40-somethings or those with young children, those with older children, those who are empty nesters. This is why I'm, I am firmly committed to intergenerational ministry together. And how these aspects of our lives tie together because we serve a great and glorious God who has put, put us and placed us all together here at this local church and others at other local churches to be light, to encourage one another in truth, which then involves risk. <clears throat> and not to rehash some of the things we brought out in the membership class, but do you see discipleship with that in mind? The risk involved? Oh, I, I may have to share. I, I ought to be able to lovingly share a, a struggle I have, a particular sin I struggle with, with a brother or a sister or multiple, so they can pray for me and know how to better pray for me. And there may be shame that comes from that. There may be disappointment. There may be hurt. There may be fear. But brothers and sisters, if we can't be honest with those who, <clears throat> who are part of our local body, how can we expect to then go out in a lost world with everything that you are beat down with and we are beat down with from the world? And so Paul here lays this great foundation for Timothy and all that he is encountering there as a pastor and all the church in Ephesus is encountering as believers. And so as we go, think about that. How does discipleship play out in your life? Whether you are discipling someone or you are being discipled by someone. And how does that affect our life together? Always think in that context, local church first. Because it's easy to jump into all kinds of discipleship outside of the local church. But think about it in those terms as we think about and as we go through the rest of First Timothy this morning. I'm grateful Paul, in thinking through all his authority that he has as an apostle, the foundation he laid with Timothy, and to see the fruit of his labors, to see Timothy now prepared, not completely, to minister to the believers, the brothers and sisters there in Ephesus and all they would have to deal with. And how we then come together in the things we work through. Whether it's a global pandemic, <clears throat> 
or a war on the other side of the world that has impact here, or men and women in government who make choices that hurt us and hurt in other areas or that help us. But how do we then flesh this all out for those who are in Christ, called together to serve together? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for these specific two verses. Now, though there is much we do not know, we are grateful for all that we do know concerning the life and ministry of Paul and Timothy together. And what we see through their lives together, their ministry together, how that will shape and convict and challenge us as we live out life together here at Redeemer Church and how life is lived out in other local churches being faithful to the gospel. So I ask and we ask that you would keep us faithful to your word that you would protect those other shepherds, elders, and other churches faithful to the gospel with wisdom and patience and understanding. To be bold when it is time to be bold, to stand firm upon the truth of these 66 books kept for us through the ages. And as a new covenant people, what life looks like. Even though we don't have all the details, for you and your wisdom, in your infinite wisdom, didn't give us all the details. But to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling and work it out together. Because this is not about me as a pastor or us as an elder board or us even as a church. This is about you, O oh God, and how Christ is most extolled in and through our lives, not only individually, but when we are to together and as we go from being together. Because we have been transformed by the gospel, that we would be more faithful as you see fit through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives as the word is brought forth to bear upon us. <clears throat> so in our impatience, grant us patience as we work through this epistle. Cause us to ask valid questions and to believe by faith in what you meant in the verses ahead of us all of them. For your glory, O oh God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.